they looked inside his fighter jet and they said, what's going on? Those Soviets are so primitive. <laughs> all these, elect, all these, all these, all the avionics, all these, all these radio systems, they're all using vacuum tubes, <laughs> vacuum tubes from the 1950s. Wow. Now, number one, a fighter jet, one of the one of the things that's really difficult in a fighter jet is cooling that cockpit. Because mm -hmm. it, it <laughs> vacuum it, tubes is not it, gonna help. It, it's 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 a little oven in there, okay? Yeah. Well, with a lot of really high. vacuum tech te technology, that's gonna be that's gonna be an oven, okay? Mm. That's that's gonna be uncomfortable. Exactly. Well, what they finally the engineers finally figured out that wait a minute, vacuum tubes are naturally resistant to immune to nuclear electromagnetic pulse. Hello and welcome to Shared.Care's What Is Manly radio show and podcast. Men feel more lonely, lost, and not useful in society than ever in history. Males are not attaching to school, work, or women. What it means to be a man appears lost. Is there a framework for being manly that we can unearth? G'day, Jared. How are you going? I'm going and I'm going, and uh, hopefully I'm not gone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jared. Gerald. I just, I just had a birthday, and so, uh, you know, that's – some people have a birthday month. <laughs> <laughs> the week of Gerald. But as, I love it. <laughs> but, as, but as you have pointed out, you have been extremely busy lately, and it, with eventful things happening, and indeed, I've been very busy with eventful things happening, and not all of them have been cheerio, shall we say? Uh, but I believe I have um, coped and weathered, and uh, you know, chin up and all that. Carry on. I have, uh, and you being an author, you'll appreciate William Shakespeare. One of my favorite pieces of his writing is from Hamlet in scene two, act two, where he talks about nothing, or he wrote, nothing is good or bad, thinking makes it so. And for me, I take that on board because I'm an efficiency, um, I was going to say efficiency Nazi, but maybe that's not appropriate, but I'm just like, <laughs> no, we, I've said it now. Try to avoid now that, that comparison. <laughs> I, I just like things to be efficient. And when people talk about you've got to find the positive in stuff, I always found that to be an inefficient process because if you are got if you need to find the positive, it means that either it is negative or there is a negative. Whereas I thought William Shakespeare's writing of nothing's good or bad, thinking makes it so, i.e. it's just an event. How you think about it determines what it means to you. And that for me became a much easier process. So when things happen, when, you know, shitty shit happens, I'm just going, well, it's just, that's an event. How do I use this? How do I, um, how do I, what can I learn from this? How can I take this and move me to where I want to go? Which I think links into the topic that we talked about in the pre-show about talking about is you're talking about the reader as a close observer. And it's one of those things when you're, for me, being an observer, it's, are you observing it for what it is or you are you creating a, a completely different reality uh, or creating your own reality? How do you, you know, interpret that? <laughs> it's well, right until back. you said that uh, quote, I did not realize Shakespeare had been the first existentialist. <laughs> because, you know, Camus and Sartre, you know, coming off World War II, the horrors of World War II and trying to mm. answer the question of why is there evil in the world? Uh, existentialism essentially says the same thing. It says the universe is fundamentally empty and meaningless. The human mind can't not or may not or perhaps will not uh, be able to wrap itself around the trillions and trillions of mm. galaxies and, and stars. And so ultimately the takeaway from existentialism, you may, and I hope I don't get this wrong, is Meaning is where you find it, mm. because human beings are meaning-making machines. We are, we have, we're on an evolutionary path to always interpret what we see. 
Mm. And as I've sometimes said to, <laughs> I have a I have a book called How to Lie with Charts, and <laughs> um, we we talk about statistics. Is and, that from uh, Disraeli? Because what Disraeli said, there's three types of lies: lies, damn lies, and statistics. Oh yes, of course. And, <laughs> and, and this is a, this is a, a derivative of that. And then there was another book called How to Lie with Statistics, and I borrowed the uh, I borrowed the concept. But I often tell authors, I mean, I often tell audiences when we're talking about uh, these more like statistical um, uh, data science questions mm -hmm. is, you know, as human beings in the wild, as primitive beings, we were really programmed to uh, look for three things mm -hmm. is um, who might eat me? Mm -hmm. Where can I get food? Mm -hmm. And who or what can I have sex with? Mm -hmm. So that's that every time yeah. you were just look, you're looking around. Yeah. Okay. So you're you're making meaning out of your environment. And you know, and again, uh, I learned this on Safari once is the, the guide would pick out birds and trees that were a huge distance away. Mm -hmm. And I said, How did you know? And he said, "You look at look at which way the wind is blowing. Look at look at how the leaves are moving, and of course the leaves are moving in opposite direction to the to the wind as the wind disturbs them." He says, "Now if you study the tree, and you and any of the leaves are moving in a different pattern, mm -hmm. something is there. So look there, mm -hmm. and you will see." And um, uh, so that's true. Of small game, true of, of birds, it's true of you know any. Um, uh, anything that's hiding out in the tree but when we talked about the idea of the close observer mm. um, i go back in literature to not that far back just the end of the last century mm. to my favorite uh, mystery thriller author john le carre mm -hmm. and he referred to the spies in his novels as close observers mm. And his very um, modest main character, George Smiley, was trained in his spycraft to memorize literally everything he saw. Mm. And he didn't necessarily ascribe meaning to it right away. Yeah. He simply cataloged. So it was said of Smiley that in wa walking home um, to his flat in Chelsea, mm -hmm. uh, he could, when he got home, he could tell you the license numbers of all the cars he'd passed. Wow. Now, what use is that? But in a Lucari novel, mm -hmm. you learn that if you don't pay close attention, yeah. For example, if he describes the the items on a desktop. Now, this is something that a, that a spy would do on entering a room. Uh, if you see any of the the um, uh, the detective series, I, I, mean, I actually just binge watched uh, Longmire, which came out years ago. But I mean, the the sheriff in Longmire is is a close observer. He sees things, mm. and. So yes, what, he and his investigators they would go in they would they would look on the desk they would look in the drawers they would they would look at the bedside table they they're looking for whatever they can find that mm -hmm. may give them a, a clue as to the identity of the person there the, the pictures of their relatives the the pictures of the relatives that are there and aren't there mm -hmm. are they smiling in those pictures yeah <laughs> you know? uh, and so they could gain an awful lot of insight and I think the thing that really hit home for me to about Le Carre uh, for myself as a reader, and what made me such a huge fan, was that I began to realize that as a reader, you could say, okay, he's training me how to be a spy. He's training me how to be. I want to. I want to be George Smiley. He's 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 not an attractive man, but but he he, he gets stuff done. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> he, there's different you know, ways. Different different 
he prevails. His, his genius, <laughs> his genius inspires <laughs> respect. Okay. Sex. So I want to be George Smiley. Yeah. But in in tra- in training me how to be a spy, mm. in training me what's involved in being a close observer, which has to do with number one, the motivation of curiosity. Mm. We have to be curious all the time in mm. order to learn. Or if we're not curious, we're not going to bother to absorb any detail. Okay. Yes, right. So number one, you have to be curious. But number two, as a, a close observer, you're not only observing and recording items, you're also cataloging them. Mm-hmm. You know, this was a personal item. This was an intimal, intimate item. This was this was an article of clothing. Well, what? Why, why, are, why are all these Hawaiian shirts hanging in this closet when it's like uh, below zero outside? I mean, th- these kinds of, of things. And I began to realize that in training me to be a spy and a close observer, he's training me how to read. Mm-hmm. He's training me how to think. Yeah. So the idea, and, and that's the other thing that you take away from a John Le Carre book was so well crafted as a mystery thr- thriller. Mm. is it's it is a it's a quest for meaning and a quest for truth as we were talking about mm. it's not necessarily a quest for gold nor is it a quest for power or domination although in george's george smiley's world information does confer power because if i can you know that was the cold war the information war can we find out more can we learn more about them than they can learn about us secretively? Yeah. Okay. That will give us the, the strategic advantage. That will give us the X number of seconds more warning in case, you know, so well, there's fire rains that. from the I heavens. Talk, I was okay. watching documentary on the Concorde and the, the Russian equivalent, and it was amazing how much was actually stolen um, to create the oh. Russian it was And they, they talk <laughs> about the F-135 and the, uh, the, the, China, the new Chinese aircraft. Yeah. So, I mean... And um, that was a problematic aircraft, so uh, you know, good luck stealing it. Uh, <laughs> well, that's what they say. I, that you know, I don't want to say a lot of technology from Russia, which is probably not. <laughs> well, here, you know, you, Damien, as usual, you, you, you'll get me off on um, an entertaining sidetrack. Is I once uh, wrote a fair number of technical articles in the aerospace community, and they had to do often with um, defense. And uh, the, what, the following that I will tell you is public information. But at the time, um, and this was some time ago, um, American technology was developing um, various types of uh, electrical circuits and electrical junctions and especially fiber optic ones mm. uh, that could withstand uh, the 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 first nuclear electromagnetic uh, nuclear electromagnetic pulse from uh, a conflict. Mm. Okay. And so it was a doctrine of strategy that the first thing you do is you explode something above the atmosphere and rain um, uh, radiation down on the earth that dis- disables electric system electric, electrical systems. Yeah. And so <laughs> making even our traffic lights mm. resistant was a uh, what was an exercise. Well, around that time, a Soviet MiG fighter was captured mm-hmm. and it was um, taken to Japan, to one of the bases in Japan where it was very carefully inspected <clears throat> and taken apart. <laughs> yes. And one like of the, the things balloon that, that was uh, the Chinese balloon that they, they <laughs> one, yes the balloon, go, and, and they were gathering anything that comes out of the sky we better inspect <laughs> but they looked inside this fighter jet and they said what's going on those soviets are so primitive <laughs> all these elect, all these all these all the avionics, all these, all these radio systems, they're all using vacuum tubes, <laughs> vacuum tubes from the 1950s. Wow. Now, number one, a fighter jet. One of the one of the things that's really difficult in a fighter jet is cooling that cockpit because mm-hmm. it, it <laughs> vacuum tubes it, is not going to help. It, it's 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 a little <laughs> oven in there, okay. Yeah. 
Well, with a lot of really high. vacuum tech te technology, that's going to be that's going to be an oven. Okay, mm. that's that's going to be uncomfortable. Exactly. Well, what they finally the engineers finally figured out that wait a minute, vacuum tubes are naturally resistant to immune to nuclear electromagnetic pulse. Mm. There you go. <laughs> so you know, the there was pilot, nothing to the madness, and I, I I would I would assure you that there aren't. Um, um, operational air, um, aircraft these days that 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 use that technology. I would I would certainly would think not because hmm. you know it, it. Number one, those tubes burn out, so <laughs> and it'd be know, very very. You, you don't want to ground the aircraft because it blew a tube. <laughs> uh, but uh, but but as to close observer, yes, Lacare was training me to read, hmm. and that ability to read between the lines you realize that his plot has to do with inferences about things that are not clearly stated. Yeah. Okay. There are implications. And uh, in his, some of his later novels, it was, he was fond of writing about false flag operations. And he had one, he had one novel, which was about um, a British false flag operation that was supposed to look like a terrorist act mm -hmm. it was supposed to you know tip the strategic balance but you know it was going to be blamed on the wrong people or the right people or whatever but le carré who uses an insider's mentality toward those kinds of things number one he he disapproved hardly of false flag operations no matter who would mount them mm -hmm. but number two this one that he described was particularly Badly planned, poorly executed, and just plain, if you excuse the expression, cocked up. Yeah. So, uh, which is the, <laughs> which I think is the expression that he used. Yeah. So, um, and, and and there's a certain amount of dry humor in that too, because you know you're looking at the best again. Let's go back to let's go back to Shakespeare. The best laid plans. Yes. The best laid plans of mice and men off go to astray. It's like we think we're so smart. You know, we 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 think that we've got the upper hand. We think that we've got the inside track. We think we've got the uh, secret information, and that overconfidence. You know, we can we can trip on our own. Uh, but that's where you shoelaces. That close observer, that confidence. I was watching a number of videos recently on stupidity, and they were talking about how the person that's generally. I can use the word uneducated, but that's not the term that they use, but someone that becomes so confident in their belief in themselves, then they start to do stupid things because it becomes a self-fulfilling you know, prophecy and, and they believe their own rhetoric as opposed to observing what's going on. I mean, Putin's um, invasion of Ukraine recently, I mean, you could put that under that category because he was so confident that everyone was just going to roll over and the West would just ignore it and, and he would be successful in three days. Well, what, we're 560 days in. <laughs> How wrong was that to not be observing? It would, it would seem that way. Yeah. It would seem that way. And certainly, you know, uh, the wisdom of invading Iraq when it was the Saudi operatives that presumably attacked us and the uh, and we had the same assumption mm. that we would be greeted as liberators and that very soon after that the oil fields would be productive again and the the net profits the revenues the cash flow and the oil flow mm. from those five oil fields would pay to rebuild Iraq wouldn't cost us much at all it would, you know, the, the the Iraqi share of all that oil that they were sitting on, uh, finally it wasn't going to be a, a despot who was uh, controlling it and siphoning off the dough. Uh, mm. if, in a democratic government, it was going to be go go for the the, um, the welfare of the people. And um, what happened? You know, well, number one, I mean, uh, the well, Saddam, Hussein, Saddam Hussein did what Hitler did. And just set everything on fire, you know the uh, the, the old scorched earth um, strategy yeah. is well. If I'm going to be uh, gone, then I d I don't want anything left that anybody else can use or profit by. Yeah. And um, 
you know, that wasn't that wasn't really. I mean, there might have been a scenario someplace where that was predicted, but it's we certainly didn't manage to prevent it. Mm. So, um, so yes, I mean, the, the whole series of conflict. You wonder whether you wonder in the end whether the world is better. Certainly, the world is different. I mean, um, we've just gone through what you might call germ warfare with COVID, and um, mm. The world is a, fun, a fundamentally different place. We didn't, we haven't, we didn't lose as many people as we did during World War II. Hmm. Uh, we did lose uh, uh, millions, but in terms of the disruption of the economy, and but also, I mean, look at how we're ta- we're speaking here. We're we're speaking, <laughs> we're speaking in, on 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 you know virtual video uh, r- r- conferencing method. And this was, shall we call it a reluctant tool of businesses? <laughs> well, I would imagine we, you and Before I probably COVID. wouldn't be friends if it wasn't, you know, well, it would be more difficult because we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have been in the same space. We're certainly not in the same hemisphere. For us to cross paths would have been a lot more difficult. To- well, it's, and it's become routine. Mm-hmm. It, is be- it really has become routine. And we began to appreciate the even the biological cycles of our friends and associates is uh, okay. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a completely different time zone there. You know, mm-hmm. you, 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 you're, 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 you know, you're preparing to retire and I'm getting up. And I mean, you know, I, when I, when I worked in Afri- Africa uh, there for uh, a couple of years, um, I still had some clients back in the United States, uh, some in Los Angeles, actually, and they got used to the idea that they could give me an assignment at 5 p.m. their time. And they, when they came into the office at 7 in the following morning, it would be done. <laughs> it was like magic. Exactly. What, who is this guy? Is this a zombie who lives at night? <laughs> That's what you're talking about, again, being the close observer. And not everyone has that good fortune of being able to see the broader world. I've been fortunate. I've traveled to 44 countries that I, I stopped counting at 44. I think it might be more. And and being in those countries and paying attention to what the people were doing, coming back to that, the war and and, and things like that, the average person, and I'm Polish Ukraine, so I, I've got a and Russian, I've got a little bit of Russian in me as well. And and I can say that people that I know from those areas, the the genuine people, they don't have any issues with each other. And when the countries that I've been to, all people were fundamentally the same. A smile was a smile. We all wanted to enjoy our life. They all wanted to have good things for their kids. They all wanted to have time with their friends. These are all fundamental things that we connect with. And being able to observe that, I think with what has happened with COVID and being able to communicate more globally, hopefully that's encouraged people to be aware of, hey, we have more in common fundamentally in common than the differences and and to put that into another context as well one of my business partners he's from iran him and his family they're from iran um when i grew up i grew up in the the early 70s Uh, i was born in the early 70s and and around when i was a young kid i remember it ingrained in me that uh, iranians hijacked airplanes and and took them you know to go to wherever they needed to go that was a common thing back then and that was fundamentally ingrained in me. So when I thought about Iranians, that's what I was thinking. But having a friend who's a business partner as well and meeting with his family and learning about the Persian culture and observing what they do and, and paying attention to how they live life, it was, oh, wow, fundamentally we're the same. We want this again. We want this, you know, good things for our family. We want to enjoy our life. And this is how we do it. And there was so much more I could draw from that that gave me greater strength because I had that uh, diversity of, of information. Um, well, the fact that you have that core belief mm-hmm. about l- seeing the the other person's soul, if you will, mm. uh, and it, it is a talent, I will say, and again, it requires a certain amount of close observation because it may tr- it may turn out to be that the the quietest person in the w- room is in some ways the most powerful. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's interesting in terms of perception because often, uh, and I know I think that you uh, have run across this in some of your um, uh, business seminars, is that um, 
someone in a meeting who speaks sparingly, mm. uh, who only expresses themselves when they have something really decisive to say or really insightful to say, who saves their words, mm. is often perceived as being more powerful. Mm. And, but I will say also in terms of traveling and, um, you know, I, I, I don't think I've traveled as extensively as you have. I have, I haven't traveled in Asia at all. I, I have Europe, Europe and Africa and, uh, I will, and, 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 and certainly Mexico, South America. But one of the things that I noticed, especially about our recent, uh, residents in Kenya was and I've actually discussed this um, on radio interviews with African American radio hosts. And I, my publicist at the time, said, um, and I, I was talking about my book Harry Harambe's Kenyan Sundowner, which is a literary novel about a, a middle aged white guy who goes to Kenya thinking he's going to get hookups and parties. Okay, and um, you know tourism, and and of course that's not how things turn out. But in talking about that book, my publicist said, you know, you really you really shouldn't touch those, you know, those racial issues. I mean, you just really, you know, that's third rail. Just stay away from it. Mm. And it was interesting after I did the second or third interview with African-American hosts because they had interest. In, they all their audience all had interest in Africa mm. and in East Africa. Uh, where a lot of them are, you know, ha have intense interest in Kenya, of course, because of our uh, past president's uh, um, uh, ethnic background. Um, but it turned out that their audiences really wanted to hear about that. The hosts really wanted to hear about that. And the generalization that I would give that I would say is going to be surprising to a lot of people, at least in my country, is, you know, we have been so steeped recently in Let's just call it black-white conflict. I mean, there's certainly been, you know, brown, black, uh, you know, every different flavor and all kinds of different factions. But there has been a, you know, there is the ongoing issue in the United States of when are we going to be free of slavery? Are we going to talk about slavery? How should we talk about slavery? How should we learn that history? Mm. And so with that type of caution in mind, I venture into Kenya, thinking that my whiteness is going to be a badge that I wear that 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 I that I that I wish I could somehow disguise or, you know, I, I, I'm that I'm going to some, be treated somehow differently. Mm. And what I learned is that, uh, yes, certainly the colonial history, which I'd studied in school, the colonial history of, um, of East Africa, is a very complex one and involves an awful lot of abuse. I didn't really know until I went there that really the Arabs were slave traders for thousands of years before the English and the Portuguese showed up. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that, that uh, African slaves were in households in India and China centuries before they were slaves elsewhere in the world. Um, but, but one of the things that I realized was that colonialism, yes, the, country, the countrymen there are aware, certainly aware of the history. They are aware of the, the fight for independence that was, you know, that really only culminated in 1963. They were, they're aware of the troubles and the conflicts. They're aware of all of that. But as of, in terms of what affects the public dialogue today, it is very little to do with that. It mm -hmm. is not front of mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what affects the dialogue today is there are, and historians will give you different reasons for this. Some people say academics did it. Some people say the British Empire did it. But there are 43 different tribes in Kenya. Actually, they're now 44 because the the um, um, the uh, Indian Asians are are considered to be the 44th tri tribe, the ones that were born in and um, born in Kenya. So the 44 different tribes are or the again to be. Um, politically correct, if you will, the academics will tell us, call them ethnic societies. Well, somebody should get the news out to the taxi drivers who drive me around because they'll say, well, you know, do you want to know what tribe I am? So, I mean, you know, they'll, they'll use the word. Um, 
but 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 what I want to get to is just a very simple point that the rivalry there, the racism there between those ethnic societies in Kenya is at the front of their minds every day, because since independence, many of the resources, as as happened in Russia, of course, mm. after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the resources got divided up, didn't they? Yeah. Among people who became well, oligarchs, mobsters, you know, the, the mafiosi of, uh, I mean, there, there had been a mob, but there was never never the concentration of, of wealth that, that there has been since. Mm. And at, in 1963, when when Kenya really was formally uh, let go from the uh, British Empire, three Kenyan families came to the fore for, for in the power struggles. Okay, mm -hmm. and those three families have not only ruled Kenyan politics ever since; they own most of the la most of the land and and most of the assets. The power company, the you know, the, uh, access to water resources. The uh, there's the the um, the white sands of the beach along the Indian Ocean are were all um, ceded by the uh, Sultan of Zanzibar directly to uh, the 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 current ruling family of um, of of Kenya at the time, and the, the the those families still own most of the luxury resorts that are along those beaches so i mean these this is that inequity is is very much to the fore there and as a an american as would certainly uh, probably be, be the case with um, a, a european uh, visiting kenya it's really um, oh you're a tourist well i i presume you want to spend money <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or 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 oh you're not a tourist you're a businessman i assume you want to invest so either way <laughs> there's intense interest in you but as though you are uh where are you from oh hollywood <laughs> you know uh, that's right that's right well, make hollywood, yeah. I, I live hollywood adjacent it would be it's a little bit disingenuous to say i'm from hollywood but i certainly i certainly have um you know i've played one on tv as they say <laughs> Fair that what you were talking about before with the that power of the silence power of and i, I do this of a program in my my corporate world uh called negotiation magic and one of the key sources of power in negotiation is silence being quiet and then having patience and i remember reading a, a biography about clint eastwood and talked about how he as an actor Whereas most actors would get script and they would try and buff it out and make it um, more so they had more screen time. He did the opposite. He'd take, you know, he might have a, a paragraph of script and he'd try and reduce that to a sentence or, or a sentence and he'd reduce it to a couple of words. And that created so many more powerful performances was, was how this was written. And I'm a big fan of Clint Eastwood movies um, all the way through, uh, but grew up with them. And certainly, you know, some even some of his not his ones that weren't box office, um, that were probably box office flops. The Beguiled, going back one of his first movies, there there was a lot of work that was put into to the story and and telling the story. And I'm coming back to that as to how do we you know develop that patience as to I know from my experience I've had you know, where you know you do something and you want it to happen immediately, but it's happening. You just need the patience to allow that to flow through. So you've said your piece and and sit back and and allow it to happen. I remember seeing that in a. It was another movie where it was a. I think it was a um, Die Hard movie where they, they'd put the code in and and the the bug into the computer to do whatever it was going to do, and everyone's freaking going. Nothing's nothing's happening. But the leader was just going. Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, it took hold. That the fuse. That's yeah, all the fuse. Yeah, so well, that... you know, uh, William Goldman, the screenwriter, actually um, wrote specifically about what you mentioned about mm. the idea that the star in a movie, and this was advice to screenwriters, the 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 star in the movie, and and, and he said even the bigger the star in the movie, mm. the fewer lines they want to have, mm. and the way that he expressed it was that. Often, 
very often, perhaps in every movie, uh, you, you can you can label it this way. But the the star, especially if they are the leader uh, of some heist or adventure or mm. quest or whatever, the star has a sidekick. Going back to the Western term, mm. um, but that sidekick is is often termed in the trade an opponent ally. Mm. which means sometimes they agree with them sometimes they disagree with them but the the opposition of the hero and the opponent opponent ally does create a certain amount of not only dramatic tension but interest and so goldman was saying um no star wants to give exposition okay you've got a heist movie okay steve mcqueen is going to lead the heist mm -hmm. and he's got the meeting the night before it's like and so so the opponent out so mcqueen says turns to the opponent ally and says have you got this okay that's the line you got yeah. this and for the next two minutes the other guy takes us over to the whiteboard and says, okay, well, we're going to go in from here. And then, then the, the truck's going to meet us over here. We're going to plant the charges over here. Now, the, the, this behind the safe over here. The star doesn't want to, number one, memorize this. But number two, he's going to be seen as a weak character if he's got to explain or justify to anybody. Because mm -hmm. the next line McQueen has is, good, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, explain or justify, I think, comes answers that because if you're a person of authority you don't have to explain or justify yeah. i i'm watching um re-watching i'm a bit of a star trek nerd um re-watching star trek voyager and i love the character captain janeway um uh, played by kate mulgrew and there's a number of times within there where she'll she will often listen and, and talking about observing so she'll be listening and then she'll there's there's a point where the, the line is crossed she goes okay i've made a decision this is what we're doing and it's as simple as that we're doing this and and there's no more discussion about it but she has that authority as you said it's no need to justify it anymore she doesn't have to explain it um she just has to she just says this is what we're doing i do this with my son all the time you know we were saying and, and he, 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 i think from a young age it was never you know but why it was because i said so and that was it <laughs> <laughs> that was no justification and I, and thank I, you general eisenhower yes of course <laughs> <laughs> but i mean it's not it wasn't this again it was a, a balance between we have discussions and with my son it's certainly um where i ask him you know for example with his schooling i mean he's now at an age where he's in the the latter part of his schooling and a couple of years ago i asked him well, what grade do you want to get what's your goal and i put it on him and he came back and he, he gave me a, a mark which was you know it was relatively high not the highest you know as a dad i'm like should be higher but it was it was high and from that um, at that point, uh, he had some issues with schooling from dating back to some other things that were outside of his control. And and he set a number of objectives and achieved them all. And then with the grade that he set, not only did he, he, he achieve that grade, but many times he pushed past it. And that's where having, for me, it was, again, observing, what, what do I do? What's my role here? Observing myself. What was my role as a parent? Is it to tell him how to live his life or is it to encourage him to live his life his own way? And I took the latter approach and said, well, what do you think? What do, What is right for you? And coming back to the other point of going, okay, as a leader here in the household, at the end of the day, it's still, he's not an adult yet and it's my house. I'm the leader in the house. So there's some times where it'll just be, this is the decision because I'm the leader. And then, of course, there's there's that principle that uh, psychiatrists and, and uh, educators remind us of moral persuasion. And you know, you can you can lecture all all day long until you're out of breath about what should be done. And that old expression, which is leveraging on what you said, is "Do as I say, not as I do." Mm. <laughs> okay, but the opposite is true. The child is going to do as they see you do. Mm. And they're going to completely, and I, you know, the, again, we're going back to the movies. It was one of the stars, a female star, who said to her um, 
to her producer. She said, you know, and she's emerging from the theater and she said, you know, I just realized that the audience isn't going to remember a word I said in there. But they're going to remember the emotion I had under every line that I said. Mm. And that is compelling because you begin to realize that. Um, actually, I saw John Cleese talking about Monty Pata the other day, and they were they were talking about how when they finally I'm writing about made that. the trans <laughs> when they finally made the transition to doing American television and film, uh, you know, and then they went and did the feature films, hmm. and you know they had been really they'd been the masters of sketch comedy, and they'd been the, ma the masters of theatrical skits. Mm. So yes, there was sight gags, but it was very highly verbal. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, it, you know, um, Lauren Michaels was on there also commenting, saying, "Well, oh, isn't there an inspiration? I learned how to do comedy from." <laughs> he didn't really go that far and say I learned how to do comedy from them, but 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 Cleese was saying that when they first um, met with those directors, they were saying, oh, well, you know, this is a vi visual medium. People have got to, you know, that you can't just say it, they've got to see it. Mm -hmm. And that was true to an extent because, I mean, they were talking about this one scene where, you know, in, in the first movie they made in medieval, and they were all slogging around in the mire and the mud of this medieval village and whatever. And they go, well, um, how do you know that that guy is the king? He said, he's the one who has no dirt on him. <laughs> okay. And they said, the scene wouldn't have worked if we hadn't really paid attention to the fact that really we were really slogging through the mud. But but then, then Cleese took another breath and he says, yes, visual medium. But then, you know, we've been talking for the last 45 minutes. <laughs> So, indeed, as we are now, I mean, you know, um, the 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 dynamics, and again, one of the reasons that uh, that this visual conferencing medium is can be so much more powerful than podcasting is, yes, of course, podcasting is, you know, radio drama. You know, we're filling in the blanks, whatever, and, and it's interesting that the sound and the intonation of our own voices. I mean, I remember. When I first got involved in radio, I was listening to my voice in the cans, and it was like, "Is that me? <laughs> wow, wow, that wow, that's that voice is just oh, I mean, it's just got it, you know, richness oh, in it. Of course, it's being it's it's going through all the high and end pass filters in the you know in, on the on the board in the in the control room, but um, mm -hmm. you know, it's lovely that they sweetened it up. But you know, in in the medium that we're in now. There's so much more information in watching us with our expressiveness, with our, I mean, okay, body language from here up, sure, but still. Um, well, that's part of that observation it, that you're talking about. It's a richer medium, yes. It's a richer medium. Yeah. How and does it that... permits us to be close observers. It permits us to be, okay, I see him. Was he sincere when he said that? Was he looking somewhere else in the crowd when he made that comment? When he comes onto the stage at the rally and he points to, oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all those people, are those, is he actually pointing to friends or is he just pantomiming having relationships with faces he can't even see? Mm. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about, okay, I'm asking myself, what is, what is the content of this person's character? How not only can I, I mean, certainly I, I've, I'm, I'm hearing a script. I'm hearing, a, I'm hearing talking points. And all of us, whether we're sincere or whether we're simply uh, delivering a, a, a canned presentation, have messages and talking points. Mm -hmm. But in terms of expressing ourselves and having, shall we say, heart behind our words, Mm. I think people do pick up on that. Mm. Uh, now, about an actor, when we're talking about Hollywood, I you know it may have been the last. I I don't know whether we talked last time about Joaquin Phoenix or not, but I was I was talking about him and the Joker, about the fact that a method actor, particularly mm. method actors and uh, people in law enforcement, 
both understand that anybody's capable of anything. Yes. Because but because to yeah. be the Joker, Joaquin had to delve into himself and find some part of himself that was capable, even mm -hmm. for a moment, even for, you know, now, is he going to live in the character through the whole shoot of six, ten weeks? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, because some character, some actors do presumably stay in character for the whole time. I, I don't know whether that's true. I doubt that they would be in character to their children if they saw them in the evening. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in, in the case of Joaquin Phoenix, he's a vegan. He's a pacifist. He's a he's an activist, he, wildlife activist. So, you know, he's not that character at all <laughs> in his outward persona. Yeah. And yet I'm sure if you were to meet him and he were to talk to you about the menu in his diet, mm -hmm. he would be he would be able to speak to you with equal sincerity about why he eats the things that he eats. Yes. Well, this is good for me. That 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 that's harmful this, for this particular, you know, um, ecosystem. Uh, this is endangering the species. Uh, this is harming that dear creature. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, whatever, whatever those, and, and it's not just one reason. Yeah, there there are. There's, that's a multifaceted reason. It's like it isn't binary, and and that's another thing. I think that we learn from being close observers of the media, say, when we're taking in information, is so often choices are presented to us as binary. <laughs> you know, we're this party or that party. We're we're for or against. Yeah. And one of the things you and I have discussed is that the richness of communication, the mm -hmm. richness of storytelling, and also the richness of argument, if you will, in the legal sense, is debate is is the nuances of, of either side debate. and when there was that famous uh exchange uh, between kellyanne conway and the uh, interviewer and she used that term I, it maybe had been used before but it was alternative facts mm -hmm. and you know she was derided for that and and deserved to have been i suppose but if you insert a couple of words to make that a longer phrase, alternative sets of facts. Mm. There, yes, there are no alternative facts. There's there that person either suffered a bullet or the bullet went past them. Yes, that's a fact. The investigators are going to find that out. And yeah. and whether that, that whether that bullet was fatal fail or not. Mm. But alternative sets of facts as to whether that person was holding a gun in their hand when they were shot, for example. Mm. If that is left out of the news story, you have an alternative set of facts. Yeah, and I, you know, when I was telling you about um, um, trying to imagine myself being a stroke victim for mm -hmm. one of my uh, novels, as, as, a, as an old fellow trying to put together uh, pieces of mem of a fragmented memory, mm -hmm. I began to realize, even though I'd never, I. I I do experience it. I don't experience it with the severity that he did. I I realize that looking back on memories, I'm not sure whether I was the cause or the effect. I'm not sure whether the thing that happened that I'm remembering happened first, or it happened bef whether it happened before or after some other event that might have been triggering. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so if 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 I got punched in the nose mm -hmm. um, again, ha had I thrown a sucker punch to the other person first? <laughs> um, if I if I said something hurtful to one of my parents, and and certainly uh, I've 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 had those memories because neither one of them with me anymore, and sometimes I look back on on things that I wish could have been different. Mm. And I remember, you know, I remember specifically saying, you know, uh, something hurtful to my father. I remember very specifically some hurtful things he said to me, but not not in that instance. Mm -hmm. But then again, what was I going through at the time? I mean, it. it I mean, I mm. I don't want to absolve myself and say, oh, that wasn't a mean thing to say at all, because it was a mean thing to say. I was going, I was going for the jugular. I was being nasty. I, it was, it was hurtful, and I have no doubt that it was. Yeah. But then again, 
what was transpiring in my life that, you know, if I was telling this to uh, a therapist, they might say, well, don't you realize that you were going through fill in the blank? Or, you know, and 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 and, and in fact, and I, I had expressed this before, that often looking back, the experiences that I, you know, they say, oh, well, you know, look back on your happy memories. Well, I know I've had a lot of happy memories because I've been happy a lot of my life. And, you know, for, for, for periods where I think I wasn't you, depressed or down. I'm, I'm but then again. For that. How did you do that? Well, but what I will say is that the memories that I have that are most vivid are when I screwed up, when I did, when I really, when I did something sinful, if you will, something when I it was real, real mistake or transgression. And this, this one, uh, um, uh, psychologist expressed to me, she said, well, maybe that also is a survival thing as a, as a, as a, as a human species. Maybe you're remembering things, the things that you needed to learn from. All right. And that's interesting. And, yeah. you know, this is going back to your or original point of Hamlet saying, you know, but the mind makes it so, neither good nor bad. Mm. Well, again, we're talking about leadership seminars. We're talking about, okay, this was a challenge. This this was a reversal, but you have to take this reversal and make it an opportunity. That is take that is making meaning mm. out of an event that that interpreted one way, mm. that event is, oh my God, things are never going to be good again. Mm. Or Oh my God! This this city's been pulverized. It'll never be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Or this relationship has been destroyed. There's no going back. Yeah. Okay. But there's also a way of looking at that. Now it might take longer term. It might take effort. It might take resources. It might take help from some other person or group of people. You know, the 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 alcoholics affirmation that I I need the higher power or I, I need the support group. I, you know, I can't do this by myself. So it may take a realization of, okay, I don't have to necessarily solve this all by myself. Mm. I'm in a world full of people. And the next realization is, Damien, as you know from your travels, I'm in a world of caring people. Yeah. All I have to do is ask. And, that you know, there's some ministers who tell you, I mean, going back to my my uh, preacher Evan Wycliffe series. There's some ministers who tell you there's really only one prayer, and that is, God, I know that I already have everything I need. That's now that's that's a difficult thing to <laughs> get across. That's a difficult thing to to convince yourself of, if you will. Now you know, but if you say the affirmation mm -hmm. right here and right now, the power of God is. That is a that is a statement that it's it's when you say it with some affirmation it's difficult to argue with it. Okay, it, 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 if you believe that it exists, it, it always exists. It is all. It is never not powerful, and it's here, right here, and right now. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> we were laughing. My son and I were laughing when we were watching the June movie uh, that was out recently, well, a little while ago now, but. Um, and in that, the father and son were talking, and it was whether the son was going to take over the father's role as the, as the king of whatever it was, the, the space region. And the father said to the son, he said, it doesn't matter. You choose what's right for you. I'm paraphrasing. You choose what's right for you because you're already everything you need to be. You're my son. And that's it. That's all you need to be from my perspective. And we laugh because I've been saying that to my son for a while as well. And it's interesting where, you know, you mentioned about that from that is is to know that you are enough just because you are. That's that's pretty profound. And well, wasn't it Shakespeare also who said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made? Mm. I mean, when you when you when you when, what you just look at the evidence of science and okay they're not trying to convince you of your your 
inherent worth. But when you begin to realize, you look at the results of the Webb telescope and whatever, the, that we're the results of 14 billion years of stellar evolution and numerous star systems headed to exist mm -hmm. and, and for millions of years and then be destroyed to cook up enough heavy elements to, the, to exist in our bodies today. The heavy elements in, in our, when, when, when a, 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 a protostar, when, when a, a new star lives and explodes, it only, ex, it only produces the first few elements in the periodic table. It mm. has not been, it has not been cooking long enough to come up with lead <laughs> or or iron okay which you know is the core the core of our earth iron yes. you know but but um uh so and and you know iron wasn't in the big blast i guarantee you i mean if, if that's <laughs> indeed how the universe got made it was that's another it was hydrogen it was hydrogen that that then you know it was it was um it was particles that, that coalesced into hydrogen that then probably you know some some length of time later became helium and you know and, and you know the rest transpired and then finally all that gas collapsed into a star and started to cook hmm. and so then those those elements became heavier elements heavier elements heavier elements in the in the core of that star until it exhausted its nuclear fuel and it just went i give up boom yeah <laughs> So, um, you know, and, and then forming the dust that became planet. So, so again, our bodies are that. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you not respect that, that, that we're made of that material? And, um, and, and it's, it, it, you know, as with gazing at the extent of the, of the universe, it's, it's literally uh, um, an unbelievable um, mm -hmm. miracle. I mean, it, it is just, so we're so complex we're we're so ancient in a way mm -hmm. um and and the the world that we've been given to live in is just so you know it's so marvelous here i mean again you're 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 you know to go back to william shatner and, and his recent quote that you know when i got above the atmosphere i i wasn't filled with the inspiration of the uh the expanse of the heavens i was i was i was i was humbled and i was touched and i began to cry at 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 how marvelous the earth is and 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 how 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 precious it, it, it precious and fragile it is mm. and 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 that's how he came back i mean every one of the astronauts that have been up under uh, have, have been up there they all come back transformed they all mm. now they all say different things you know um uh, you know, there was, um, uh, I, I can't, I, I don't recall his name off, Ed, Edgar, Edgar, um, uh, he's the one who came back and he was convinced that, that he, he had, he had looked at aliens and they'd looked at him or some, something like that. And, um, he's not around to talk about it anymore. Um, but he, I mean, he had a, you know, look, <laughs> old age, I don't want to say that. <laughs> he was done away with, <laughs> um, don't let the conspiracy uh, out. <laughs> yeah, another conspiracy theory. I mean, they they shot everybody that uh, that that, um, that saw the craft. It's funny when people think that the government's creating conspiracies. I mean, most times the government can't organize most things. Let alone well, uh, no, no, Damien, this is again. Let's come back to Le Carre because this is one another thing that he teaches you. Yeah, is that any time you have a group of people together mm. who are involved in whatever they might be involved in mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of citizens moving a tree stump from down the block with mm -hmm. unpeating traffic or a bunch of spies that are trying to put together a false flag operation, whatever, or a political party. Mm -hmm. Those are all conspiracies because they tend to want to keep their deliberations to themselves Mm -hmm. from the other groups mm -hmm. so even though they don't affirm or commit to operating in secrecy they do or mm -hmm. they try to mm -hmm. now their conspiracy implies a nefarious end or an illegal end so maybe that's maybe that's the boundary of of conspiracy but then of course you've got activists you know the you know, back when I, in my younger days, we were going to, you know, 
protests against nuclear testing in the atmosphere. Okay, I mean, and, or nu nuclear testing uh, period. Well, you know, we got to the demonstration site and the person with a bullhorn said, now there's a line right here and the police have agreed. If you step across it, you agree to be arrested. If you don't step across it, then it won't go on your record and you can go home. Mm -hmm. uh, so I won't confide what I did, but let's put it this way. I don't have anything in my record. Um, <laughs> But as far as conspiracies are concerned, if we're talking about trying to get to the truth, mm -hmm. and it, we'll, let's go back to Kellyanne Conway and the alternative sets of facts. Mm -hmm. A conspiracy theory is an alternative set of facts. There are some facts in there. Mm -hmm. You know, this... This this place got bombed. Okay, that, that's a fact. We can all agree to the physical evidence that got bombed. But the other facts that are in there and these the um the inferences that are made from those facts mm -hmm. are wildly different from one conspiracy theory to the next. Yeah. But what a spy master will tell you is, especially after some length of time and in a so-called free society and with investigative reporting, it's impossible to suppress the truth a lot of friend told me just recently they gave me this wonderful quote they said truth is like a lion you don't need to defend it you let it loose and it can defend itself yes truth will out but the spy will then add how do you counter it if you want to hide it mm -hmm. the way you counter it is you let a thousand flowers bloom mm -hmm. you you encourage and publish every conspiracy theory you can find. <laughs> you subsidize books that sound authentic, yeah. that ring true by people who might be considered to be authorities, and they're half full of lies too. You could also release low price radios that only have one radio channel giving the narrative that you want. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You you <laughs> let you let podcasts loose on humanity. That's true too. Uh, and 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 well, I was and actually referring podcasts. to stuff that happened in the nineteen thirties, but <laughs> themed pod. Yes, yes. Rachel, uh, Rachel Maddow, God bless her, and her her history of uh, how this all happened before, which and undoubtedly um, you know is is clo very close to the truth. But the idea being that you confuse. The minds of people with, especially if you've got conspiracy theories and movies or books that are based on those, and they include some extremely bizarre elements, when somebody talks about the conspiracy theory that happens to be close to the truth, they go, well, it's as wacko as that is. This comes it's a conspiracy to, theory. It's, it's a label. That we're talking about before being a good observer, being able to notice the difference. I deal with this. And it's interesting. Um, in the, I've dealt with a lot of court cases um, in my time, and it's interesting how the detail is what the judges will look for in an affidavit. If someone's got an affidavit and has a number of motherhood statements and another person has gets into the, the detail of what happened, that creates more credibility to what's happening because that detail's there. If you actually experience the event, you can ex describe it in more detail than someone that's making it up, unless you're a really, really good storyteller. Um, and that's where, again, that observer that we're talking about, being that that good observer, is paying attention to those you know, conspiracy theories or the, the, that narrative that is out there, a propaganda narrative, um, and going, well, does that actually makes sense but you got well, the think. close observer to has the, the, the close think. observer has two questions that we're very familiar with it, number one is who benefits mm. okay who benefits so when we're trying to surmise or infer the mm. motivation for a crime who would be better off if this had happened Mm. Or who would think they were better off than happened? It might be unwise. And so, then when you collect uh, the pieces of evidence, 
uh, again, to use a, a, a time-honored expression, connect the dots. Yeah. How? how what, where? Where do the? Where do the? the where does the nexus of facts lead? Is is there what what in in the internet world? Uh, when we're talking about um, data science and analyzing which sites are um, not only popular but which sites are influencers, mm-hmm. the measure of an influencer is whether the site is a hub. Mm-hmm. And a hub is a, uh, is a site that has more links pointing to it than it has pointing outward. Yeah, that's an, that is by definition an authority. Now it might not be a correct authority. But it is it is a place where people are going to to find out what it said about whatever it is that's under question. <clears throat> and one of the things that happens in, in in this in this crazy media world of ours is you know you will see you will see um, Rachel Maddow say you'll you'll see somebody uh, a news caster or what the british would call a news reader which it may be a little bit you know, she's more than that but i mean um, um it might be better if we thought of them as news readers but um but seeing a, a news reader and then and then they'll pop on a guest mm-hmm. and usually if it's a breaking story the guest will be an expert well how did that person become an expert mm. the producers of the show are keeping track of who are the hubs on a day-to-day basis on the stories that we're following. Mm. So what happens is those persons are on what we used to call a speed dial. <laughs> and when the story breaks, it's Damien's the expert on business-to-business co- uh, effective communication. Let's get him on. Because mm. that, that guy really tripped over his lines. Or mm. we can't believe him. Or whatever. So Damien gets on. Well, the more that happens and the more Damien gets on, the next time you tune in, Damien's a newsreader. <laughs> <laughs> Damien's got a show. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and, and in comedy, it was it was the same way. <laughs> you, know, you, you you had um, you had the comedy show, and then you know the the uh, the correspondents or the the bit players or the people who gave you know the news for the the report from the field. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, now they've got their own shows. <laughs> They're spinoffs. And the same was true of the comedy series. The, you know, Mary Tyler Moore, and then there was Rhoda, and then there was, you know, the, all all the all the series that spun off that. So that's that's the nature of television, also, is you know but why the, is the need for category? fresh faces and the need for new stars. Mm-hmm. We don't all we don't want to stare at, you know, Walter Cronkite Kite forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, they want to bring in somebody younger and more more relevant and um and that happens and and uh and and you may be perceived as well you know that's kind of like the 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 crusty point of view let's find you know but but then again i'm i'm finding you know we've got we've got well, that was of course Chevy Chase when they're barely that he out just of school wasn't funny anymore <laughs> well and in the yeah, in the case of Monty Python, John Cleese said they st- were starting to repeat their own jokes, and that's why he want he wanted outweigh before the others did. He had more, but the yeah. other the other thing they pointed out was he was getting more offers. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we're, who benefits? See, who yeah. benefits? <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. We've talked for a while now, and you mentioned if we're talking about being in a good observer, if you can summarize up before we finish up. I mean, you mentioned about curiosity, but what what does it really take for someone to be a, a good observer? Not just of what you see, but also to of what you hear, the emotions, and even you know more that gut feeling as well. How do we become a, a good observer? Well, the test of instincts, I think, is tricky, mm-hmm. difficult to acquire. Usually acquires some gray or red hair by the time you get to the point where maybe you learn to oh, no trust it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so on. Again, we're close observer. Why did he? Why did he? Why does he cut it all the way off? Um, <laughs> what's he hiding? Yes, <laughs> or disguising? Um, see, I couldn't do that. The shape of my head is really unattractive. Uh, 
it's it's not as nicely formed as yours. So I mean, I I I realized long ago I couldn't get away with that, even though it, it, it it's certainly an alternative now that it's all thinning. But uh, I'm a close observer, I will say, <laughs> it does begin with curiosity. And Brian Grazer, the Hollywood producer, wrote an entire book about this, and he he was talking about his own career uh, as a producer. He's a, a Ron, Ron Howard's uh, uh, producing partner. And incredibly successful uh, background as a lawyer, but um, when he was working as a young man in Hollywood, he off, he said, you know, I one of my early jobs for the studios is I would I would run scripts around town. This was back when they were you know three hole punch with breads in them and a cardboard cover. <laughs> and and he said, you know, if I had to take a script to like a producer's house or or a studio executive's house or a director's house or a star's house, I would ask to come in. Yeah, because I would always say something like the script had to be delivered personally. Well, nobody would question that. You know, the servants might have, or the 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 the, um, the assistants, <laughs> 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 to be be a little bit kinder, may have been told, "I'm not seeing anybody today." Mm -hmm. Okay, which which will be the standing order probably. Yes. But when a guy is standing there with a script in the hand and say, I'm from this, I'm from the studio and I'm to deliver this personally, mm -hmm. nobody wants to ask questions. They let all let him in. <laughs> so there he is. And once he's inside mm -hmm. and he's encountering that the the grand lady or the big man, mm -hmm. well, this is this is a celebrity in their own home. It's like Oh, Damien, why can we get to your drink? <laughs> oh, would you like something? I mean, a glass of water? I mean, you know, uh, he would never refuse. He would always get something. He would sit down. And then, be, you know, he would he would go through the... But he'd actually let the script sit there. And then he would say, um, you know, he would repeat his instructions. Yes, this is from so-and-so. And -so, but ask me to give this to you. But, but, but would you permit me a few questions? And he would throw questions at them that, see, often they wouldn't know what the script's about. Yeah. Okay. It's just being, you know, read this. Okay. Mm. Well, I'll call you in the morning and tell you why. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's usually the thing, right? Yeah. But the celebrity's going, I don't know why he's answering this, but, but you know, again, the celebrity's on their own turf. He's not threatening them. Mm. They have a desire to look good and be honest. Mm. So he would often ask them questions about what was the what, Clint? What what was the breakthrough in your career? You you played piano uh, up at uh, up up at the the army base, and your wife your 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 mother was kind of a you know what bar girl? Uh, he wouldn't say hooker, but you know his mother was uh, uh, an entertainer in the bar. Mm. How did you get from there to, you know, such, I mean, what was the real first step? And, you know, and Clint would probably answer and say, well, you know, um, I thought maybe I could be a movie extra. I knew how to ride a horse. And uh, I, 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 I asked for a co connection down to Universal. I got a job as a stuntman. Mm. Okay. Then that was how it started. He, and then he got to be known as a Western guy. And then Sergio Leone came along and said, well, you know, uh, I can't find any stars that want to go over to Spain and shoot low budget movies, but you look like one. <laughs> how, about I give you, how about I cast you in my next picture? So the Spaghetti Western was born, the so-called Spaghetti Western. So so number one, a close, a close observer not only looks for details, but asks questions to anyone who will give them information. Mm. And I would say in today's world, a close observer also is fundamentally a data driller. Now, you might say everybody in your son's generation, you don't need to tell them how, <laughs> okay? <laughs> now you can type it into BARD and you let BARD drill for you, but I mean, you know, you know be, be prepared to accept the consequences. But, um, yeah. you know, that's, that those powers of investigation mm. in our educational system, you know, I, I remember my great uncle, who's a phrenologist, he, he felt my head and he says, son, you're going to have a great memory for names, dates, and events. Okay. And it wasn't until he did that to my brother, I realized the names, dates, and events. I realized he just basically was, you know, this was his speech. <laughs> <laughs> so I was flattered in the beginning. But, but, but then I began to realize that that studying history mm -hmm. in school 
as a collection of dates, dates and events, especially now, gets you almost nowhere. Mm. No, and no, number one, the kids don't have patience to absorb it. Okay. But I remember one thing my seventh grade history teacher said that has stuck with me ever since and that has proved analytically insightful in many of the situations that I just see in the news and directly per pertains to your background, Damien. Mm -hmm. And he said, remember this, Russia will always co covet warm water ports. Okay, Afghanistan for the uh, Persian Gulf, uh, uh, Syria for the Mediterranean, U Ukraine for Sebastopol and the sub base that's there on, on the edge of the Black Sea. Connect the dots. Mm. There's nobody on the news. There is nobody in the news that I've heard who's reporting on Putin and his motivations. Because you talk about, oh, he stumbled into something that, you know, he thought he was going to over quickly. Well, I will submit that, I mean, I'm not, I'm <laughs> certainly no defender of, of Vladi, but I will say he had to go into Ukraine to, to defend Sebastopol. If, if, if Ukraine had fallen into insurgents and somehow a, a hostile country had taken over his nuclear sub-base, of which he only has two in the world, one in Sebastopol, one in Vladivostok, hmm. what would you do if you were? sitting on that red button over there. Well, now, mm. so yes, the close observer has to say who benefits. Yes. The close, close observer has to say, all right, as, as Longmire, Sheriff Longmire is going into this um, uh, house on the Indian reservation, he's not even supposed to be there, okay? <laughs> I've told him, this is, you have no authority here. And yet the person who's been harmed mm. was harmed in his county. Yeah. Where he does have authority is is is, is a, a, a an Indian young woman, and he knows that the way that the that the reservation operates, the 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 Indian police force has only limited authority. They probably will not investigate this young woman's disappearance. So he's in that room. He's asked the mother for permission to go into the house, and he's looking in the bedroom in all the drawers. He's looking, looking, looking at the, those pictures. He's looking at at the clothes. Are are, are a lot of the clothes gone? Uh, she didn't really have that many clothes. Uh, are are there any? Is there are are there soiled or or stained things on the on on the floor as though maybe she was wounded and she left in a hurry? Okay, and so you know he's already asked the mother, did she have a boyfriend? Oh no. No, mm -hmm. she's too young to have a boyfriend. Okay, well, I just found five things in the room that suggest to me maybe um, you <laughs> should have had a conversation with your daughter. Okay, this is what an investigator does. So, so the inferences from detail, mm -hmm. but you don't, and that's another thing that those detective stories, I mean, again, like my amateur sleuth, the preacher Evan Wycliffe series, he's not a, he's not a police, police proceduralist. He doesn't mm -hmm. know police procedure. Yeah. He's a, He's a he's a he's a somewhat agnostic Baptist minister who people come to with the problems nobody else will solve. Mm. So he's just somebody they ask for help. And he went to MIT and he went to Divinity School and he was disgusted disgusted with both. But guess what? He's got some analytical ability and he knows how to d drill for data. Mm. Okay. So so he 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 says I'll help you as much as I can. I you know I'll 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 see where this leads. Well. Seeing where it leads takes a whole 250 pages <laughs> you know, to get to the You've end. got to drill through that data. So. <laughs> well, you know, and and indeed, he he knows he has to, he, he, he's hmm. secret best friends with the sheriff. I mean, the sheriff can't say, I want you to look into this for me hmm. because, you know, I have no budget for it. And the case is technically closed and cold. We didn't, we don't know who did it, but frankly, officially, the district attorney doesn't care. Mm. Okay. So see what you can find. And by the way, we'll meet again here in the parking lot or maybe over at the Walmart where nobody will, you know, know, know it's us and I'll be in an unmarked car. Um, so, you know, he's got these resources, you know, he's got, he's got the, he's got the gal who uh, practically runs the local diner. She talks to everybody. She knows all the gossip in town. Well, if you would have asked me, <laughs> I'd have told you, you know, that they that they're, you know, seeing each other, yeah. uh, even though she's married. You know, I mean, all that stuff. And the so, um, Evan, the close observer has those smarts, 
of and again like like the minister the idea that a small town runs on gossip <laughs> and that's actually a kind of a survival hmm. mechanism because yes you have to you have to have a skepticism about gossip hmm. you you shouldn't be repeating everything that you hear mhm mm but then again, like a good investigative reporter, if you can hear it from multiple places, multiple sources, and you hear substantially the same from mm. everywhere, then maybe it's something you should ask somebody who might really know about it, or maybe you should maybe you should test the the other thing that a, that a, a a close observer does that a scientist does is you know a, a, an inference is a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. The working the working theory. Well, what you do is you conduct an experiment. You you test the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So if if a series of robberies have been happening at a particular place, or, you know, with a particular set of circumstances, if I real if I figure out well, what bank hasn't been hit that has that has a similar set of vulnerabilities and, and circumstances, maybe I'll stake out that place and see if anybody shows up. Mm -hmm. That that tests the hypothesis, the so called stakeout. Yeah. Will 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 they return to the scene of the crime? Will 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 a similar crime be uh, committed by someone who is similarly motivated? Mm -hmm. So this is the basic police work, but you know it's not. Yes, police procedure does codify that into a series of steps, and also what you would call what the bankers would call tests of transactions, mm -hmm. is if if you apply this step and you get a result. And you get it consistently, then that that is some confirmation that your hypothesis is correct. Uh, but a a a banker, especially a, an auditor who is testing, these days there are no books to inspect. Mm. There are no pages to go through and and cross check. There are only computer systems. Mm -hmm. So you can't if you if you call up the pages of a computer file, you don't really have any. Since since those pages are soft, you don't necessarily have any mm -hmm. confidence that they haven't been forged. I mean, the, yes, there are timestamps these days, and there are there are safeguards. But what what a what a computer auditor will do is test of transactions. Mm. They they will they will invent hypothetical transactions, and they're put in the system and they say, if this system is genuine, if this system is legitimate, I know what I'm going to get on the other end from this set of data. Yeah. If they don't. Then, <laughs> who skimmed along the way? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Gerald. It's been wonderful chatting with you again. I really enjoy these these conversations. There's a lot there for the the listeners as well uh, and viewers. Just uh, we'll have the details of Gerald's books in the show notes as well. Check them out. Great stories, great ways of learning and learning through story how to become a great observer, which is going to be more beneficial for you in your life and helping you move forward as well. Uh, so, Gerald, pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much for taking your time. The power of storytelling, it builds community, and we just proved it. So thank you, Dan. Thank you for being part of the Share.Care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you.